Hello everyone, and welcome to my Xbox 360 collection video. The 360 is probably my favorite console of all time, and as a consequence, this is by far the largest portion of my collection that currently sits at about 370 titles. So close, I know. But to avoid a three hour video, I'm going to be splitting it into two parts. Part one will cover all of the games that are backward compatible with the Xbox One and Series X, and in part two I'll cover all of the non-backward compatible games and all of my digital collection, because I'm one of the few collectors to have a pretty sizable digital collection as well. No doubt the majority of the more obscure titles will be in that later video, but I can practically guarantee there's still a few things in part one you've never seen. I'll also share the tips and tricks that I learned while collecting, plus show off some of my favorite games that I've played thus far, some lesser known hidden gems to look out for, and my expensive titles and holy grails. Though admittedly, there will be a lot more of those once we get out of the Microsoft section. So hopefully this video will be both entertaining and educational for those of you that are looking into collecting for the 360. Or if you're more into the PS3 side of things, still stick around for a minute because the first category I'm going to cover is exclusives. I've split up everything into their respective genres and provided chapters down below so you can skip through to what you're looking for. And with that, let's get started. The narrative has always been that Xbox has no exclusives, and while that has been especially true more recently, the 360 had a lot more than you might think. I've split these into three categories here, each being less exclusive than the last, depending on where you'd like to draw the line. This first group is true exclusives, games that can only be played on the 360. Both the 360 and PS3 each got their own exclusive Katamari game, and by all accounts they both turned out pretty good, though this is the more original of the two. Katamari Forever on the PS3 was kind of a best of compilation of a bunch of different levels from the series history. It occurs to me that some of you might not have ever heard of this series considering there hasn't been an actual release in over 10 years. The King of the Cosmos has, as always, accidentally doomed the universe and destroyed all the stars, so it's your job to roll up a big enough Katamari of random assortments of objects so that he can turn them into new stars, all while bumping along to some jazzy J-pop. It's funny, it's weird, and it's 110% Japan. Give one of them a try if you never have. Microsoft decided that they wanted to give another half-assed attempt at courting the Japanese market, so they snapped up the first two games of Hironobu Sakaguchi's new studio, Mistwalker, as exclusives. Blue Dragon is certainly the more controversial of the two. It's a game that everyone either loves or loathes, so you should at least give it a shot. Personally, I've never been a fan of Akira Toriyama's distinctive art style myself, but it won't stop me from playing through Blue Dragon one of these days. Fable 2 is considered by many to be a near-flawless game, and while I'm not sure I'd go that far, it's an excellent example of a choice-heavy Western RPG done right, and it remains one of the best reasons for RPG fans to own a 360. Fable 2 does have physical DLC, but it was only included with the Platinum Hits version of the game in America, which, as you'll see, is kind of a trend with the 360. Of course, we have the incredible Gears of War series. I don't have the first one on 360 because it was remastered on Xbox One, but all three that are here are excellent games, though Judgment is a little weaker than the others. While the main campaign is a bit of a letdown, not many people know there's a second mini-campaign hidden behind the first called Aftermath that's much more in line with the trilogy quality-wise. Personally, 3 is my favorite. The game was a graphical showcase at release. It refined the gameplay to a mirror sheen while adding new weapons and mechanics to mess around with, and the story ends off the 360 saga in a satisfying and heartbreaking way. Whether you're here for the innovative co-op third-person gameplay or the scathing critique of the Iraq War, Gears is a must-play series that has carried the torch for Microsoft with one banger after another while its flagship franchise has crashed and burned in the meantime. Hopefully we have many more awesome Gears games ahead of us. Infinite Undiscovery is a game that not many people have heard of, but everyone I've met who's played it has sung its praises. It's an action RPG made by the developers of Star Ocean, and features a real-time decision-making system the likes of which I've never really seen before. I can't wait to get further into it. Lost Odyssey was the other game made by Mistwalker that Microsoft grabbed. Often referred to as the true Final Fantasy XV by fans, it's the only 4-disc game on the 360, and that alone should give you an idea of this game's greatness. Lost Odyssey is considered one of, if not the greatest, JRPG of the entire generation. This is where I'm going to have to bring up a trend I've noticed. Gaming critics don't understand JRPGs or horror games. Unless it's the most mainstream possible titles like Final Fantasy or Resident Evil, those two genres will get dumpstered on Metacritic for no discernible reason. I'm bringing this up now because Lost Odyssey, along with other masterpieces of the era like Nier, Eternal Sonata, the Tales of Zillia duology, Dragon's Crown, Folklore, and others, could barely crack an 80 at best from critics, and games that were anything less than perfect would be seen in the 60s and 50s. Trust me, if you're considering whether or not to buy a JRPG or horror game, especially from this generation, you should completely disregard the Metacritic scores. Though both of the previously mentioned JRPGs do benefit greatly from backward compatibility. Some might be surprised to see Ninja Gaiden 2 here, but the original version of the game isn't exclusive. There was a highly edited version released on the PS3, and again in the more recent Master Collection. 
Personally, I'll take the original all day, as the changes for my taste resulted in an inferior game. If you want a closer look at the differences in each version, Austin SV made a great video that I'll link down below. Just to be clear, he doesn't know me, but he makes extremely in-depth videos that explain all the ports of a game and what was changed for each version. If you care about having the best possible version of a game like I do, then his videos are invaluable, and he deserves a lot more subs. This is a cool triple pack that includes the first Trials game, Limbo, and Splosion Man. You can get Limbo physically on the 8th generation, but if you want Trials and Splosion Man physically, this is the only way to get them. Explosion Man is a new take on 2D platforming where all your jumps are powered by blowing yourself up, and it's a great time. I have yet to finish it, but I'm excited to go back to it one of these days. I have way too many hours in the Trials games. They provide the type of physics-based racing that you can't really get anywhere else. I'm gonna date myself here, but if you've never played it before, it's a lot like Max Dirt Bike on Newgrounds, but obviously a lot more fleshed out. You tilt your bike back and forth to climb over obstacles and finish with the best time and fewest crashes possible. It sounds easy, but it is a physics-based game, and the tracks go from a drive in the park to balls out impossible by the end. The second and best Trials game really hit it out of the park, but unfortunately it's the only game in the series to never get a physical release on consoles, so we'll get to it in part two. The next section of exclusives I have is what I'll call console exclusives. These are games that also came out on PC, but if you want to play them on a console, you're gonna have to get them on 360. This is one of the coolest packages I have for the 360, the Ubisoft Triple Pack. Some of you might not remember, but Ubisoft used to make good games once upon a time. You get an HD port of the stellar Beyond Good and Evil. Hopefully we'll get that sequel any day now, am I right? If you've never heard of it, it's an action-adventure game where you work to uncover the secrets of your corrupt government and save your planet. Back in the day, it was one of the best games of the sixth generation. You also have the only physical editions of From Dust and Outland, which are both great games in their own right. From Dust is a god simulator game where you try and help your people thrive and keep them from becoming extinct, which is clearly their favorite pastime. And Outland is a Prince of Persia inspired platformer where you try and restore balance in your broken world. The art style and music are really beautiful, I want to get further into this one soon. As you can see, this is a PAL region game, and that's the version you want to get because this package wasn't released in America. Europe actually gets a lot of stuff like this, so keep an eye out for European imports in your future collecting endeavors. Especially now that region locking is mostly a thing of the past. Speaking of which, some of you may be saying, But Agro, the 360 is region locked. Why yes, it is, but far from every game on the console is region locked, and this is one of the titles that isn't. PlayAsia has an extensive list of every game and every release in every region for 360, and whether or not they're region locked, which I will put down in the description box. So give that list a look if there's an import you'd like to pick up, but you're not sure if it'll work on your console. The second Condemned got a later release on the PS3, but the first remains exclusive to Microsoft, and it's a very well executed game. As you may have seen in my 2022 game ranking video, I enjoyed it a lot. This is one of the few horror titles for the console I'd recommend picking up. I'm also really excited to get into the Divinity series one of these days. I've heard nothing but effusive praise about it. I practically shit bricks when I saw the Larry and Baldur's Gate 3 announcement. I kinda wish they were doing the KOTOR remake instead, but uh, that's a close second. Frontline's Fuel of War was unfortunately not the trenchant takedown of American expansionism that I was hoping for based on the title and intro cutscene, but it is still a surprisingly good game. Frontline's has beautiful graphics for the time and utterly outstanding game feel. The campaign is structured similarly to Battlefield 2 Modern Combat, a game that we'll get to in a minute. So maybe something to pick up if you enjoyed that game's open objectives and freedom to complete missions in your own way. Yes, your eyes don't deceive you. Splinter Cell Conviction was a Microsoft exclusive, for some reason. The only one in the series. I honestly couldn't believe it at first. The final section of exclusives is what I'll call HD exclusives. Cross-generational games that released early enough in the 360's lifecycle to be ported over to 360 from 6th gen. So if you want to play the best version of these games, you need them on 360. But just be aware that these are 6th generation games that were ported, so they're not going to be lookers. Avatar The Burning Earth is a funny title because for a while it was one of the most expensive games on the system, and that's because Achievement Hunters nabbed it due to your ability to get a thousand gamer score in the first five minutes of the game. You just needed a high enough combo in the tutorial. Thankfully the price has come down a lot because it's still a fun co-op beat em up, though it was sorely in need of polish. Bully's Remaster is also an HD exclusive on 360. It did release for the Wii, but as most people know by now, the Wii's graphical specs and resolution output were much more in line with the standards of the 6th generation. There is a different print of this game in an Xbox One style box with Xbox One and 360 at the top, but it's the same version as this. That new box was just to denote that it was backward compatible. 
However, this version does have a manual and a map of Bullworth Academy, so this is the version to get. A lot of open world and western RPG games, especially from Bethesda and Rockstar, had maps in one of their editions, so that's something to look out for. Unless you don't care about maps, but... Whew, if that's the case, don't talk to me, please. When I move into a permanent home, one of the first things I'm going to do is hang up every map I have in the game room. Earth Defense Force 2017 was technically ported to the PS Vita, and you can play it on the PlayStation TV if you're one of the eight people that owns one of those, but other than that, it's exclusive. Here's what the seventh generation was known for, the first-person shooters. I played the hell out of Battlefield 3 for years. I locked every attachment and camo on every gun. That game was a blast. Still has a pretty good campaign, too. The graphics blew me away when I first played it. I still need to get around to the Bad Company games one of these days. Oh, sorry, I just saw the uh, Greatest Hits cover that I haven't replaced. Just oh, give me a sec. I'm of course a huge COD guy. I have over 30,000 hours in the series, I played competitively for many years, and I've played every campaign many times aside from World War II onward, which I still need to finish. World at War is still pound for pound the best World War II FPS ever made. Black Ops is a timeless classic that had storytelling the likes of which most AAA games still can't reach the heights of. Modern Warfare 1 and 2 really pushed the envelope of what was acceptable to have in a video game with their extremely realistic AC-130 scene and, of course, the infamous airport level. Both the Modern Warfare trilogy and the Black Ops trilogy, which consists of World at War, Black Ops, Black Ops 2, and nothing else are both awesome single-player first-person shooter sagas. It's a shame that most COD players I talk to nowadays haven't even played the campaigns. I do have all three of the Call of Juarez games that were released physically, but I need to grab a new case and cover for the first one. I've heard great things about this series. It's probably the best that you can do if you're looking for Western shooters. Unfortunately, outside of Rockstar, there's very little of that subgenre to choose from. Of course, there's Halo. Combat Evolved was the first game I ever played. 2 was the first game I ever beat. I'm reading through all the books for the first time at the moment. Halo is in my blood, it's really sad to see what the series has become, but this was the golden age. You might be wondering why I have all the original games, even though they're on the Master Chief collection. That's because that game is borked. Almost every time I tried to play a campaign in MCC, I got a weird soft lock or glitch that wasn't in the originals. Plus, I just like having the box art. Reach is pretty firmly my favorite in the series at this point. It's the game that made me want to get a 360. The campaign nailed its tone perfectly, and the multiplayer, Yes, in spite of armor lock, was the peak of the series. Plus, you had Forge that gave you so many tools to make fun custom games, it was just a blast. In less than a year, I clocked more than a thousand hours in Reach. Let's just say I did a lot of sleeping during class in 2011. The other two Bungie FPS games were both practically perfect as well, though they really should not have sold ODST for $60. Despite not being a mechanically sound RTS, I still enjoyed Halo Wars. I believe this is still the only way to get it physically as well. I didn't hate 4 as much as most people at release, and even played it enough that I considered trying to go pro, but it's definitely soured over time. The people that are mad about Chief having a personality uh, clearly didn't read the books, but the issues go a lot deeper than that. The enemies aren't fun to fight, the new weapons are just clones of the old ones, the multiplayer copied Call of Duty, and the story, which literally requires you to have read all the books, the comics, played all of Spartan Ops, seen all the Vidocs, and the lower dump collectibles from Anniversary just to understand it, is still crap. At least the graphics were mind-blowing for the time. That was back when we still had hope for 343. <sighs> anyway, here we have two of the better FPS games on the console, made by Starbreeze Studios, who, outside of Bungie, was the king of first-person shooters in the 2000s before they more or less disappeared after Payday 2, which is a real shame. Syndicate's an underrated game to check out if you want a fun sci-fi FPS with superpowers. The gorgeous graphics and lightning-fast gameplay make it a game that no FPS fan should miss. It's been about 10 years since I finished it though, so I need to play through it again. The Darkness is also a really fun series. It definitely earns its mature rating with an unflinching edgelordy tone, but it has solid gameplay and an out there plot. It's one of the FPS series that I really need to go back and finish. By the way, the protagonist, Jackie, definitely takes the cake for having the most amount of guns on him at any one point in time. The limited edition of 2 does come with a good sized poster as well if you're interested. I've only played Time Shift for a few minutes, frankly, but it has good atmosphere, an intriguing world, and of course features a time-controlling mechanic. That was a pretty big trend at the time, now that I think about it. The enemies are hardcore bullet sponges, though, I mean on another level. It got okay reviews at the time, but I guess it just fell by the wayside. It was certainly one of those games you saw on the shelf a hundred times, but never bothered to pick up. The 360 continued to build off of the 6th generation that finally brought Western RPGs to consoles. 
Did they play worse on console? Sure, but that didn't matter at the time, and nowadays if you want to spend more time playing the games than fixing them to work on modern PCs, the console versions are still here. A lot of the games that had DLC also released a definitive edition that had all of it physically on the disc, like Human Revolution, Dragon Age Origins, Oblivion, Fallout 3, and New Vegas. Dragon Age 2 does have a definitive edition, but none of the DLC is physical, it's all just vouchers, so don't feel like you need to get that version. If you've never played Dragon Age Origins, it's just everything you could possibly ask for in a fantasy RPG. The combat system is flawless, easily in my top three gameplay loops ever. You have deep, likable characters, a world that's interesting and fleshed out, a banger score and solid plot. Dragon Age Origins is one of my all-time favorite games, you absolutely need to play it. It's the only game that I've ever beaten and then immediately played it all the way through a second time. It's that good. Oh man, here it is baby, the Mass Effect Trilogy. As a trilogy, which I think is fair because it follows the same protagonist and the same overarching storyline, it's my second favorite game of all time. Every entry is radically different, and some do things better than others. One has the best story and world building, two has the best characters and writing, three has the best gameplay and presentation. Each game on its own is great, but only together are they perfect. And if you know the plot of the games, there is something really beautiful about that. If you die before playing the Mass Effect trilogy, I deeply pity you. For God's sake, play it. You won't regret it. You do want to get the Legendary Edition that released recently rather than buying them on the 360, because the trilogy has a lot, and I mean a lot, of DLC. It's not just stupid garbage like most DLC either. It's pretty much a third of the series that you'll be missing if you don't play it. The Legendary Edition does make some creative changes that I don't like, but it's still the best looking and most accessible package out there. You can also make your own cover art for it. Here's mine. I still have the originals because, sadly, I bought all the DLC before the announcement of the remaster, so that's a good two hundo down the drain, but hell, I do it all over again for Mass Effect. You might notice I only have Risen 2 here, and that's because, weirdly, Risen 1 and 3 have received remasters and were even released physically in Europe, but not 2. I have no idea why. They're not great games by any stretch, but you put pirate and RPG next to each other in a sentence and I'm there for it. The performance of this game is not good though, even the graphics would barely pass for PS2, and there's a significant amount of screen tearing, so it's definitely one that you want to play via backward compatibility if you have the option. You might notice a glaring omission from this list, the best modern Fallout, New Vegas. That's because there's a specific version that I want of it. The GameStop exclusive version included a map, and it's been pretty difficult to find. That's a big thing to keep an eye out for when collecting for this generation is that, for a time, stores like Best Buy, Walmart, GameStop, and others had specific variants of games with extra stuff. A lot of the time it's just dumbass shit like a gun camo, but other times it's something you actually want, like the soundtrack, art book, or map. So if there's a game you're looking at, Google the name of it with a couple stores or check through eBay to see if there are variants of it that you prefer over the standard edition. We got a bunch of really quality hack and slash and beat em up titles this generation. And also Lords of Shadow 2 and Force Unleashed 2. Everything else here is worth picking up though. I'm so glad Azura's Wrath is finally getting its due. It's gotta be the most over the top game I've ever played, to the point where it's pretty hard to impress me with spectacle nowadays. Plus it's got a unique art style, compelling characters, and a bop in OST. Truly one of the best hidden gems on the console. This is one that really benefits from backward compatibility, which helps fix a lot of the screen tearing issues that it had on original hardware. Thanks to Capcom though, the true ending along with some extra scenarios were sold in on-disc DLC for 7 bucks. Stop it. Get some help. If you want to pick up this game, I really recommend getting it soon because it sold very poorly. So it's gonna be really damn pricey in the coming years. I haven't played too far in a Brutal Legend yet, but so far it's been killer. I've heard there are strategy sections later on which really dull the pace, but hopefully it won't be too bad. Oh boy, here we go. Before the FPS genre, there were Doom clones, and before the hack and slash genre, there were God of War clones, which is what everyone called Dante's Inferno when it first came out. If you wrote it off as well, you should definitely give it another try. It's a much better game than its reputation would suggest, especially in the story department. While not a direct sequel, Killer is Dead is the much lesser known spiritual successor to Killer 7, but it's just as stylish and retains all of the grotesque charm of Suda51's other works, with a bit of extra noir on the side. The seventh generation was one of the best times to be a fan of the, um, distinctive auteur. Mini Ninjas is a complete departure from IO Interactive's usual output, but it's a cute game with a great sense of humor that was highly underrated in the seventh generation's grid-enthralled market. The Force Unleashed Ultimate Sith Edition is the only steelbook I have in my collection because they tend to be too easy to damage for my taste. 
But this is the only version of the game that has all the DLC on the physical disc, so if you want to turn Luke Skywalker away from the Path of the Light and make him embrace his inner demons, then this is the version you get. Oh, actually, uh, on second thought, sore subject. Personally, I wasn't a huge fan of this game. It lacked a lot of the polish it needed to really shine, but it's still worth a play. And it was one of the best Star Wars games of the late 2000s. Practically by default, yes, but still. There was a PS2 version of Force Unleashed that some people considered to be better than the 360 release because they couldn't implement the new janky physics engine onto the older hardware, but having played through both, it's not a significant upgrade. Plus, it removes the most iconic moment of the game, the Star Destroyer scene. So, you can decide whether it's worth the trade-off. Both versions still have Shock T, so they're both playable. Wow! The choice of JRPGs on the 360 is admittedly few. Enchanted Arms is a controversial title at best, and I have yet to meet anyone who truly enjoyed the FF13 trilogy all the way through. Still, I haven't gotten around to them yet, so I'll have to see for myself. Moving on, this is what we'll call the action-adventure slash open-world section. Alice Madness Returns is easily one of the best games of the entire generation. This isn't your daddy's Alice in Wonderland. It's set in a vile world with a gruesome aesthetic, and a story that got a lot more adult than anyone really expected. The gameplay that mixes third-person action with 3D platforming is challenging, varied, and provides a steady progression throughout the game. With this disc, you can also download the original game that was only released on PC for free, which some consider to be even better. If you get nothing else out of this video, you have to play American McGee's Alice. You won't be disappointed. Hopefully we'll get that third game at some point. Assassin's Creed 1 is the only AC game that still hasn't been ported to other consoles, but it does have a variant with a bonus disc that contains behind-the-scenes footage, developer diaries, fan films, and some trailers that I've never seen before. A cool little extra to have. To this day, the first Assassin's Creed might be the most underrated. Yes, the gameplay can get a bit repetitive at times, but the open world was utterly gorgeous for the time, and the storytelling was the absolute zenith of the series. If you started on 2, you should definitely go back and play the original. Arkham Origins was bashed when it came out for not living up to the previous level of quality set by the series, but being the worst Arkham game still makes it one of the best games on the console. If you never gave it a chance back when it was released, it's time to pull it off the shelf. It's not like we're gonna get another good Batman title anytime soon anyway. There was a complete edition that was only released in Germany, but in addition to it being outrageously rare, it only had vouchers for the DLC, so no need to worry about it. I've finished GTA 4 two or three times by this point, and I've never sided with Playboy X. Dwayne for life, baby. But seriously, if you've never played GTA 4, it is the highest rated game on the console and tied for the second highest rated of all time for a reason. It's not the greatest game ever, and the gameplay will probably feel a bit jank to first time players, but it's still one of the best games on the console and deserves a spot in anyone's collection. The complete edition has both expansions physically, so that's the version to get. Mafia 2 does have all the physical DLC, which is definitely worth getting, but it's only included in the Greatest Hits version, so get yourself a new cover if you want to. Some people might find that a bit unsavory, but eh, it's my collection, and trust me when I say we're not going to run out of copies of Mafia 2 or anything else like it anytime soon. While the open world left a lot to be desired, the storyline is moving and the gameplay is solid. Despite the genre's popularity in film, gangster games, and especially good ones, are few and far between. If you like the time period, or if you just want those sweet, sweet girly mags, Mafia 2 is a good pickup. I just replayed it last year and had a great time. I recently learned that The Forgotten Sands actually has four different games released on different systems, and the one for the 360 might actually be the worst one. The channel I Finished a Video Game did a great series retrospective on Prince of Persia recently that goes through every game in that weird disjointed series. I'll link that down in the description if you want to check it out, he's got a fantastic channel. I've been hearing how good Red Dead Redemption is for years, I gotta get around to that one soon. We also have the Tomb Raider and Splinter Cell games. Two franchises that I'm really excited to jump into. Either Prince of Persia or Tomb Raider is what I'm going to be streaming next on the channel after I finish up the remaining Metal Gear games. I haven't quite decided which I'm going to go with, but I'm leaning toward Prince of Persia at this point. The collector's edition of Double Agent does have one of the better slipcovers I've seen, so that's pretty cool. Maybe something to pick up if you see it. There weren't too many horror games on the 360, and far fewer good ones, but you did have Aliens vs Predator. It has three separate campaigns where you play as the alien predator and a marine. It's one of the better games we got for the franchise, but remains strangely underrated. The second Dead Space is one that you want to pick up on PS3 because it has some extra content that came physically, and I believe it's also one of the few games that runs better there as well, so it works out. We also got the Fear series, which is on the whole pretty excellent. 
Though most people have a lesser opinion of the third game, which changed developers from the first-person shooter horror experts at Monolith to the inexperienced Day One Studios. Fear Files provides two great expansions to the first game in physical form. I, along with other fans of the series, would probably suggest playing those instead of the later entries. Are we ready for more shooters? No? Well, it's the seventh generation, that's what we got. Switching to the third-person perspective this time, 50 Cent Blood on the Sand is considered to be the better of the rapper's two games, but that's still not saying too much. It does play better than I expected, though. Funny enough, this game rocketed up in price in late 2021 from $30 to nearly cracking $120 in the span of two months, and I have no idea why. At the time, I thought that 50 Cent had died, but obviously, as we know, the man is immortal and unkillable. It's since come down a lot, but it's still one of the most expensive games on the system, and that's only going to go up, so if you want to grab it, I'd do it sooner rather than later. Army of Two was a series that I always saw on the shelf, but never picked up. It just seemed a bit too generic, and from what I've heard, my expectations are borne out. Also, only the first game is backward compatible, because the series got worse as it went on, without having a terribly good starting point in the first place, so... I guess EA didn't want to bother with bringing the other two up to date. I really want to get farther into the binary domain soon. It has a destitute world ravaged by war, a bunch of killer robots on the loose, and it's also one of the few games that could use the 360's microphone for voice commands, which I'm sure works super well. It was created by the same company that now makes the Like a Dragon series, and has almost the same level of camp. Of all the cover-based third-person shooters we got in the era, this is one of the more interesting ones. Eat Lead The Return of Matt Hazard is a really odd title. It stars a video game action hero from the 2D era who just hasn't quite found his place in the realm of 3D games yet. It's a tongue-in-cheek, self-aware romp that doesn't have the greatest gameplay or performance in the world, but I suppose you could look at that as being part of the narrative, if you want. You could almost look at it as a response to Duke Nukem Forever, but this actually came out first. I'm still only about halfway through, but it's close to the top of my list of 360 games I want to finish this year. As you'll see later, it's also got a download-only arcade sequel. Weirdly, they only made the second Kane and Lynch backward compatible for some reason. Thanks, Microsoft. Lost Planet is basically Starship Troopers the game. Except maybe with fewer fascist undertones? I guess we'll have to see. It's a fun game, but I tried it out at the time when I was attempting to beat every game on stream blind on the hardest difficulty, and this game's persistent timer and tough boss fights completely brutalized me. I have to go back to it soon and play it on an intended difficulty, though. Max Payne 3 was, to a lot of fans' great chagrin, a big departure from the series' first two titles, especially with the tone going from grounded crime thriller to full-on action movie. It could be said that Max also lost a lot of his characteristic wit and charm in place of, well, a lot of cursing. But Max Payne 3 is still a great game. It's the first in the series I played and made me want to go back to the previous two titles. The graphics for the time were outstanding, and the story takes you through a bevy of beautiful locales which are then promptly shot to shit. This game was one of the most expensive ever developed at the time, with $105 million poured into development alone, and it certainly shows. They couldn't even contain the campaign on a single disc. This is a must-play look at the booty shooty for anyone who enjoys the genre. Another game from Grasshopper? Yeah, like I said, it was Sudasan's Golden Age. Shadows of the Dam's play is somewhat similar to Resi 4, with an over-the-shoulder camera and a bit more measured gameplay, especially by this company's standards. The story is far more irreverent than usual, though. It says it all on the cover. This game's a trip. Spec Ops The Line is my eighth favorite game of all time, and let me tell you, a game has to be pretty damn incredible to crack my top ten. Jaeger got a check in the mail, and the only requirements they were given was that it had to have multiplayer, and it had to say Spec Ops on it. They could have taken that check and made the most generic piece of crap the industry had ever seen, but instead, they made something truly special. More than ever, the less you know going into this game, the better. Just play it. Spec Ops is a one-of-a-kind miracle of an experience, the likes of which we'll probably never see again. These are some of the few adventure games I have on the 360. I know that genre is getting kind of nebulous at this point, so to me, Adventure just means that it has a little bit of everything. Some combat, some platforming, some puzzles, and nothing exemplifies that better than the LEGO games. Enslaved Odyssey to the West is one of the first hidden gems that gets brought up when talking about the 360. It's an adventure game made by one of my favorite developers, Ninja Theory. The storyline loosely adapts the plot of Journey to the West, and it also provides the same beautiful facial animation that Ninja Theory has been known for. Seriously, it can't be overstated, this game is drop-dead gorgeous. I have to admit, I still haven't finished it though. 
This is one of the only major releases of Ninja Theories that I haven't beaten yet, and yes, that includes Kung Fu Chaos, which I beat as a kid. I really want to try and get around to this one in 2023. And here we have some of my video game compilations on the 360. I use that word loosely because I included anything with two or more games on the disc, and that on the disc bit is why Alice Madness Returns isn't here, unfortunately. They could have easily added it to the PS3 version physically, I'm sure, but just didn't, so thanks EA. The Castlevania Lords of Shadow collection is the only way to get Mirror of Fate on a console, and the only way to get Lords of Shadow's two story DLCs physically. Not that you'd be missing much by skipping either, I've heard, but I guess I'll have to see if it's worth playing once I get to it. Deadliest Warrior Ancient Combat is an awesome release. It includes two fighting games with legendary figures and factions that were featured on the show. This physical release also has all of the DLC that was released for the games, which gives you five new characters. It also has three unreleased episodes of the show, 30 new weapons, and a couple new modes, making this an overall killer package. The games themselves are fairly unique among fighters, taking inspiration from the PS1 fighting game Bushido Blade, where instead of doing an 18 hit combo to take off a quarter of your opponent's life bar, one or two strikes was enough to do you in. And the game became much more about proper defense, feints, and measured aggression than any other fighter before or since. These games aren't quite that hardcore, but your amount of life is still comparatively low, and you need to fight tactically rather than spamming if you want to win. And it retains Bushido Blade's injury mechanics, where you can lose an arm or a leg early on and you still have to try and win. I love these games. They're some of the few fighting games that I ever played online. I still need to go back and fully complete them one of these days. The Metal Gear Solid HD collection was probably the best compilation ever released for the system. It was, however, completely outdone by the Legacy Collection that unfortunately only released on PS3, which I also have. Sons of Liberty and Snake Eater I prefer to play on their original PS2 releases because their pressure sensitive mechanics are completely broken in the HD release, so the main reason I still have this version is mainly just for Peace Walker. Peace Walker does run a lot better on the 360, and I was also having issues with it getting corrupted on PS3. You know, typical PS3 stuff. But the Legacy Collection is still the better overall package. Metal Gear is my second favorite series of all time at this point, and if you've never played a Metal Gear game, my god do I envy you. Start with either Metal Gear Solid 1 or 3, and you're in for the ride of your life. We're probably never going to get another true Metal Gear game again, so now is a great time to start. I can't believe I slept on this series for as long as I did. Here we also have one of my imports for 360. The special editions of Monkey Island 1 and 2 released on the Xbox Live Arcade and PlayStation Network stores, but it also got a physical release in Europe. Like I said, Europe gets all the good stuff. It adds remastered music, voice acting, and uh, new and improved visuals, which honestly look pretty shit to me, so I'm just here for the original games, which you can switch to on the fly whenever you like. This is of course region free, so if you'd like to track down a copy, I'd get it sooner rather than later. Aside from the original PC releases, which, good luck getting those to run, this is the only way to play these games physically. I doubt you'll find anyone playing TF2 on 360 at this point, but the orange box still has all of Half-Life 2 and Portal, so it's more than worth it. Plus it's still fairly cheap, at least on 360. Finally, Zone of the Enders, probably as close to a playable mecha anime we're ever going to get. This contains both of the PS2 games remastered and MHD. It's a series I really need to play soon. They unfortunately made the Gaiden GBA release into a tactical role-playing game instead of a shoot-em-up, but hopefully it's still fairly good. My last category is just some miscellaneous games I have here. Racing, flying, fighting, simulation, strategy, that type of thing. Just anything I didn't have enough to make its own category for. Driver San Francisco is still my favorite driving game of all time. Great game feel, awesome mechanics, unique narrative, it's definitely one to pick up. You can jack in and out of every driver on the road and use them to crash into other racers or criminals, or use them as a screen to protect yourself from marauding gang members. It's a completely unique experience among racing titles, I'd highly recommend it. Unfortunately, physical is the only way to go with this one, as Ubisoft delisted it from the online stores, meaning that this is already one of the more expensive 360 games, and it's only going to get worse. Beer's Edge is a once-in-a-lifetime type of game. It's the type of thing that just sticks with you. If you've somehow never heard of Mirror's Edge, it's an absolutely stunning parkour first-person platformer set in what we used to call a dystopian corporatocracy, but now we just call it 2023. This is one of the major must-plays of the entire generation. Definitely give it a shot if you haven't. I have yet to play its sequel, Catalyst, but I haven't heard great things about it. 
Hopefully it defies expectations for me when I finally get my hands on a Series X. Motocross vs. ATV isn't a particularly good series, but I used to play it all the time on PS2 with my best friends, so for old times' sake I wanted to grab one for 360. I went with Reflex because it's the highest rated and it has the most badass cover art by far. Port Royale 3 is basically a poor man's Sid Meier's Pirates. Maybe something to check out if you like that game, but it's nothing amazing. Stuntman Ignition is a game that probably not many people have heard of. It's a game where you play as the titular stuntman trying to pull off driving feats for a movie that's being made. Fair warning, it's not exactly an easy game. You get very little instruction and the stunts are wild and dangerous. You're going to need to take several tries in order to get a sequence right, but when you finally do pull it off and can sit back and watch the replay, it's an amazing feeling of satisfaction. In that way, it reminds me a lot of the photo shoots in Amps 2, which is a fantastic game that we'll have to get to later. Stuntman is a game that really benefits from back compat though, so make sure to play it on a 1 or series if you have the option. And that just about caps it off. Those are all the backward compatible games I have for the 360. Not including the digital only ones at least. So here's the real kicker. Why should you collect for the 360? Well, let me see if I can convince you. The seventh generation was a transition period that resulted in a sort of balancing act or confluence point if you will, where gaming was starting to become big business and games were getting a lot more money poured into them, which led to a huge selection of spectacular high quality products. These were also games that, at least until the end of the generation, focused on making money through the quality of the experience rather than how much they could milk off of whales with gambling problems or kids with access to their parents' credit card through disgusting, immoral, and debatably illegal practices like loot boxes and microtransactions. At the same time, there was still a lot of AA developers, and not every game was put through the corporate grinder of focus testing. It was a time when true artists had the resources to complete projects that would never have seen the light of day in a different era, given to them by publishers that were still fairly hands-off during development. Games like Bioshock, Spec Ops The Line, Nier, Bayonetta, Fallout New Vegas, Journey, and dozens more couldn't have been made in a different generation. Some people call it the death of video games as an art form and the birth of video games as an industry, which, well, they're not wrong, but that transition resulted in some of the greatest games that will ever be made, and a generation that nobody should miss. Why should you collect for the 360 specifically, however? Well, it was the primary development platform for the generation, meaning that about 90% of games ran better on it, and its library is also cheaper on the whole than the PS3s. With few exceptions, you're going to be paying much less for these games that will run better on the 360 anyway. It also still has the most comfortable controller ever in my opinion, and unlike the PS3's controllers which you won't be able to use wirelessly in a few years due to their non-removable batteries burning out, you can use rechargeable batteries or a battery pack with the 360 remotes indefinitely. You also don't have to wait for games to install on the 360 and take up space. Sony cheaped out pretty hard on the laser in the PS3, so it's quite rare that a game doesn't need to download onto your hard drive, which usually takes several minutes and over time can take up all your storage. To my knowledge, there's also no way to delete those games without deleting the updates that come along with them on the PS3, so I think you're just going to have to buy multiple hard drives if you want to keep all the updates once the servers go down. Let me know in the comments if I'm wrong about that, though I'm not as familiar with the PS3's hardware. But by comparison, 360 games never need to be installed, but they can be if you want quicker load times and a slight bump in performance. If you do plan on getting digital titles or DLC, the Xbox Live Store is easy to navigate and still works mostly fine, but the PSN Store is a non-functional nightmare. From constant glitches and crashes to the service not even accepting credit cards anymore, if you want to pick up anything digitally it's going to be much less of a headache on the 360. That's about the only differences though, mostly minor stuff. There's nothing wrong with getting a PS3 instead if that's what you prefer. I just chose this as my primary platform for the generation because I planned on getting both regardless. If the PS3 is your primary platform, then you just have to see if the exclusives entice you enough. So let's say you're convinced. You want to start collecting for the 360, but when should you do it? Well, unfortunately the real answer is about three years ago. That's when the games were at the lowest they're ever going to be. Mainstream collecting for this console hasn't begun because the people that had it as kids haven't reached college age yet, but you can bet that by 2026 the prices of games for the 7th generation are going to skyrocket, just like they did for the GameCube, PS2, and Xbox in 2020. The prices of games are already steadily on the rise as I write this. 
So if you want to start collecting for the 360, do it as soon as possible, because the games that are already approaching or have even surpassed their original price will be unattainable in a few years, especially now that YouTubers are starting to make retrospective reviews on this generation, a process that's been highly accelerated by the current state of modern gaming. Aside from price, there's another reason why I collected for this generation when I did. Updates, DLC, and digital titles. This is the first generation where games being unfinished on release became an unfortunately all too accepted part of the industry. Sometimes games needed updates to be brought up to snuff, famous examples being Skyrim, Battlefield 4, Diablo 3, Fallout New Vegas, and others. There are plenty of games on this console that needed updates, and you want to get them before they're gone. I haven't noticed any updates being taken down for 360 thus far, but the PS3 has been doing shadow takedowns of updates on a regular basis since at least early 2021. These patches are not going to be around forever, you want to get them before they're gone, and you need a copy of the game to do that. Also, if you want to collect any digital-only titles, you need to do it as soon as possible. Publishers don't renew the licenses for games, and they get taken down all the time. Sometimes lost to the ether forever. The games I remember being heartbroken that I didn't get to purchase were the X-Men arcade game and Turtles in Time Reshelled, which got taken down before I started collecting games digitally. But there were at least 20 or 30 games in the 7th generation that I was interested in that were no longer purchasable. Make absolutely sure there's no DLC or digital-only titles that you want before they get taken off the servers. Whew, well, that about wraps up things for part 1, the backward compatible chronicles of my Xbox 360 collection. Tune in, hopefully, sometime soon when I discuss the other, frankly, more interesting half of my amassment. Thank you for watching, guys. Have a wonderful day.